Here. Director Ajibo? Here. Member Seidel? Here. Member Melvin? Here. Member Kinley? Here. Member Cheeseman? Here. Yes, it's very convenient for you, sir. And Mary, may I say it's always a pleasure seeing you. I'm a member of the authority, and I want to thank everybody for their service, especially the staff, and uh, which is a special place to me. side of a bridge vehicle or a safety vehicle like a state police. And we're just talking about a snow situation in Monroe. This, this company is headquartered in Kalamazoo and based and they use this quite frequently down on the western side of the state. <coughs> and, uh, so our partnership with U of M and uh, this uh, American Indian family is what brings your attention. And I will leave uh, one of these with Thank you, Mayor. Anyone else from the public wishing to address the background bridge vote? Seeing no one else, we'll move on with the agenda. Under item three, uh, we have several minutes to be approved since our last full board meeting. If it's a pleasure, we can do it under one motion. and supported that the, the minutes of the committee meetings be approved as presented. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item four, we have a special guest with us today. Sergeant Ryan Werner will be here to 
discuss the commercial enforcement division uh, about the bridge. And uh, we're always very appreciative of the working relationship with that on the bridge for the admissions. Thank you very much. Sergeant, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you again for having me here today. Um, basically what I have up here is the MBA activity report. This is a report that we run every year and it's broken down into each quarter. Um, it's basically a breakdown of our enforcement that we do as commercial vehicle enforcement on the Mackinac Bridge. Um, because of the Mackinac Bridge, there's a few key infrastructure um, notations that we have around to make these numbers happen. Uh, we have what are called weigh-in motions, which are the scales that are built into the infrastructure of the roadways. And this is a detection screening tool for screening overweight trucks. Um, with this tool, we're able to screen them, stop them prior to getting on the bridge where the infrastructure damage could occur. Looking at the numbers on here, there's a few key numbers I want to point out, and that's our weight enforcement and our follow too close slash passing. Those two areas are areas that we do continue to take uh, strict enforcement on and see continuous violations. Um, the breakdown of the weight fine structure in the last year, we ended up totaling $62,006 worth of weight fines. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of the key enforcement around our overweight has been in relationship with our good communication with the bridge authority. Because we're limited on our numbers, we don't always have somebody always available. So by having the Mackinac Bridge Authority screening these whims as well, when I have officers or myself who aren't in position or off, they're able to screen the same screening tool as we are. And through that, they have called us off hours and gotten some significant overweight stops conducted. Um, I would like to note in the last year we did find and recognize some uh, overweight carriers that were fly by night. Um, we were not seeing them during our normal shifts just based off of the amount of people we have on the road. We had two companies I believe they were running between midnight and three in the morning which we typically don't have very much enforcement activity at that time. So based off of meeting with the uh, bridge authority we were able to get officers in stop those overweights <coughs> and take strict enforcement on those which resulted in crossings of well over the 144,000 gross for the Mackinac Bridge. Um, another area where you'll see some strict enforcement is our cell phone or handheld mobile device violations. Um, in general that has been and is continuing to grow as the handheld violations uh, or handheld uh, cell phones continue to get, get more popular. Um, overall, we had a pretty well diverse area of inspections. So when we do an inspection <clears throat> on a commercial motor vehicle, it's broken down into three levels. A level one is a full inspection where we look at driver documents, we walk around the vehicle, look at all the lighting, tires, anything that would be on the outer portion, and then underneath the vehicle where we would measure brakes and look at suspension. Um, level two. Like I said, that's taking away the brakes and the three is just driver only. Of those there that we had noted on this report, uh, out of those vehicles, 28 were out of service and 13 of the drivers were out of service. We did have a few uh, original incidents that required reports to be conducted. Um, one of the officers had a domestic and a passenger vehicle, which they would have been an assist to the post or the sheriff's office. Um, there was a transfer of a drowning victim with EMS from the EMB MBA. We had a MBA assist with a stranded, motor stranded motorist. And then we had a serious CMV fuel leak at the bridge the one day as well. That one there, uh, the officer ended up getting there. There was call in from the MBA that there was a significant fuel leak happening. We got everything figured out on that one there never got across the bridge. None of that fuel leak made its way to the water because of the rapid catch of the MBA. <clears throat> With some of these um, numbers up here too, um, there's some of that 
are also kind of significant. The equipment violations that we're seeing are also showing a very high. So because of the time that we spend at the Mackinac Bridge and we're looking into these trucks and screening these trucks, we're able to get a lot of equipment that shouldn't be on the road, off the road, and repaired before it goes back on the road. Um, next slide, please. So this slide is a chart, and it's a comparison from 2019 up to current. It's a breakdown of our patrol hours, traffic stops, citations, our weights, and vehicles inspected. Overall, our traffic stops have been pretty similar in the amount of stops we're making. The hours are pretty close. Um, overall, we're seeing a pretty significant pattern. Um, nothing's, re nothing's really out of the ordinary on, on anything that we're running into. The same trends we're trying to break with overweight. We're detecting those under the or over the road carriers that are coming after hours. Uh, we're getting calls after hours as well for companies that are running oversized loads when they're not permitted to be doing so. So there's enforcements that are being taken that aren't always showing up in here, but they're very significant to what we are trying to achieve in making the roads safe. Um, with that, that's all I have for the charts and kind of a brief explanation. If anybody has any questions, I can go over anything with you. Trish. Just maybe two two quick questions are probably obvious for you. Thank you for the update. Obvious to you, I don't I don't know uh, law enforcement speak quite as well, but um, the easy maybe sad one first. Domestic and car meaning there's an alter domestic altercation in the car that you've been alerted to. Correct. Okay, and then the equipment. Could you could you just give us a little explanation? Like what does that mean? Like you're finding a car with equipment. Could you give a quick example of like what Yes, that? yes. So during these inspections when we're looking for um, anything that could be wrong, we have what's called CVSA, which they're the rules that govern the standard that trucks have to be kept up to. And it could be anything from tires that are either flat, bald, insufficient tread, uh, suspension systems, which is, that's what allows them to go down the road without breaking frames and everything. Um, it can be a matter of a, a lot of different things. A big one that was reflected in this slide, it's quoted as equipment because it's part of the unit, but load security is a very large one. We do do a lot of enforcement where loads are coming through not secured properly, um, which obviously that's going to be a, an issue if something comes loose or falls off. And um, Going underneath these trucks when we inspect their brakes, that's another area of key enforcement because we got to make sure with the amount of weight that Michigan allows for these vehicles to carry and the speeds that they're going that they're going to be able to stop it in that sure distance. So the equipment is an overall making sure these vehicles are being maintained properly. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. I couldn't understand whether it was part of the the, the vehicle or an extraneous part that's on it or whatever, a lawnmower or whatever. Right, and it could be yeah. both. It okay. could be both. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you for your service as well. Thank you. Item five will begin our committee reports. At this time, I'd like to call on our bylaws committee, committee chair, Caroline Key. Caroline. Okay, for the bylaws committee, uh, we gave everyone a copy of the bylaws and asked. Uh, that you get back to us by April 19th with any changes, suggested changes, and we had three um, good suggestions and we implemented them all. Uh, the first one is the location of the St. Ignace meeting and it was suggested we add a kind of a perimeter or a number of miles within St. Ignace, um, otherwise this meeting wouldn't count. So we added, I believe, 15 miles to the St. Agnes meeting, so it's within say, 15 miles of St. Agnes for that one required meeting. Uh, another, the second suggestion was that we um, change the executive secretary name or title for Kim to bridge director, and that has been adopted in all places that was um, applicable in the bylaws. And the last was, um, 
I'm sorry, I should point out the paragraphs. The last one is 9.2, the conflict of interest. And originally we had a conflict of interest with the state of Michigan, and uh, they thought that was too broad for many members on the authority who might conduct business with the state of Michigan and other cases that really have nothing to do with the, the Mackinac Bridge. So we changed that to um, directly or indirectly in any contract with the MBA. So all of those changes have been made. You can see the two copies in your binder um, with the suggested changes um, originally crossed out and the new uh, wording in there and then a clean copy is in front of that in your binder. So I make a motion that we approve the bylaws as written. <laughs> I don't, don't mean to dominate with the question. So there, there was one thing that I, I wanted to ask our legal counsel and the um, chair. Great job, Caroline, um, on these and Kathleen. On that came up in my mind. I just wanted to get the input from them and the board. Page three, section uh, Article five, section five three, and it discusses a quorum. And a quorum for the transaction of business shall consist of four members. So my only quick question is, I, I read that as um, to transact business, we would not only need a quorum of four, but four votes. But I don't know if I'm reading into that um, as an insinuation, or do we need to clarify? I don't want to make a, a mountain out of a molehill. I look at it and I think, okay, if four people show up, we need four votes. It doesn't say majority, so we wouldn't need three out of four. We'd need a quorum four. Um, but do we need to clarify that, or is that not necessary? Um, I think it can be to mean either three or four. We could bind the board. Already on the form. We could clarify things like you right. But it just, uh, uh, my interpretation of it was, was three out of the four. <laughs> the majority of president. That's the way I would look at it, but uh, we always would defer to our legal counsel. Is, is there any other questions or discussion on the motion? Before we vote, I certainly want to thank Caroline and Kathleen and, and Kim and Melissa. They spent a lot of time putting all this together, and we greatly appreciate it. If there's no further discussion, we do have a motion on the floor to accept the newly revised bylaws as presented. Okay, uh, I believe this probably should be roll call vote, Kim, if you would please. Yes. 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 Thank, thank you, motion carried. Thank you again, Caroline. Uh, insurance committee meeting, we'll call on the uh, chair of the insurance, Tricia Kinley. Trish, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, we want to give a quick update to the board. Um, the insurance committee met two times since our last meeting, um, and that is in light of the fact that our auto insurance for all uh, bridge autos uh, does renew um, October 1 and so we need high time to re-review um, we've got quotes in 
but the last time our insurance was quoted, let, um, and signed was five years ago. And in that time, uh, Cammie's done a fantastic job pulling this all together, so the credit goes to, to her and Kim for, for, and Melissa for getting us this information. But um, in the course of those five years, our insurance has increased 55%, correct, Cammie? Um, most pointedly due to the fact that we have um, a driver's assistance program to help individuals run easy about over the bridge, help them go over the bridge, their own vehicle, and a escort program. And apparently that is the primary reason, besides just, I think, probably your cost of insurance general increase over the years, most of the programs are driving a significant portion of that increase. So, um, Katie did a request for quotes from 10 companies. Um, her did not respond to give us a quote to actually deny giving a quote, citing the fact that we have this um, unique program and liability that goes with that, and others did respond with quotes. Um, at our first meeting, both uh, Chairman Gleason and I were in attendance and reviewed the votes because of that, we realized that also in light of the state's new auto insurance update reform, we really needed to do a review of liability waivers that we have individuals sign for actually two out of our three programs. That would be the driver's assistance program and uh, hauling bikes and snowmobiles over the bridge. So we have those ways included in the binder uh, for you to look at. But of course, of course, me realized, wait a minute, we think we really need our legal counsel to look at our current waiver and review them against the backdrop of our you know, no update and make sure there are no glaring weaknesses and that it dovetails because those were such significant changes. We wanted to make sure we had all our T's crossed and I dotted. So we decided to postpone any decision at that first meeting, have Kathleen review those, she has done so, and really, frankly, I'd, I'd call it wordsmithing. Kathleen, jump in. There was, there was not much fine-tuning at all to be done on the waivers. But at our subsequent meeting, we were able to have both Director Ajiba and Kathleen present at our meeting. That uncovered a few stones and rocks in that we have come to the conclusion that we need to do deep dive on how operation for the driver's assistance and steel transport transport are really operating. Not because it is an increase in our liability insurance costs, but when we really started to dive in, we as board committee uh, were enlightened we are doing programs on a very frequent basis, more so in the summer than in the winter, um, but I think averaging out over the year, it, it is a lot of transporting per day, and our concern is we want to look at the pros and cons of having our employees entering a passenger vehicle. And at this point, they're using a discretion about whether they get in the car generally are able to, but there might be, I think, a hostile dog, or if maybe they're smelling of marijuana, they can decline to get in those vehicles. But that, and that, that's, that's great, we don't want them jeopardizing their own safety, but it does open up a lot of other questions about having to make those decisions on the spot about getting into somebody's vehicle or not. And so in light of that, that's kind of, a lot all in one in that we have an insurance quote we need to 
um, uh, decide upon intent uh, before October 1, but we do feel as a subcommittee we owe it to the board to do a deeper dive, look at the costs associated, the safety for our employees getting into those vehicles, and the labor hours associated with that, and sort of that overall pro and con of the Bridge Authority staff doing those programs. And we know that the public really relies on these programs and loves them, and there's a long history and expectation, but we also owe it to our staff to make sure they're not being put in an unsafe position. Um, so in light of that, uh, CAMI has re-requested quotes from all 10 companies to give us new quotes without the driver's assistance program just so that we can come back to you with a cost analysis with and without the driver's assistance program, but then also bring to you the homework of the pros and cons about actually doing those, those programs and uh, come back with a recommendation to continue those programs, discontinue those programs, or modify those programs. And we understand those would not be popular choices, um, but we felt we owed it to the board to give you the whole array, um, not bring the quotes to you right now, but revisit this uh, later this summer in, in due time. So it's kind of the, the two-in-one subcommittee update and the status. Um, hopefully I haven't left anything out. Anybody please, please jump in and I add that. I don't think you missed anything. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excellent report. You did cover everything that I could possibly think of that we talked about during the meeting. Uh, I'm not sure that that action item needs to be uh, dealt with a motion because we do have a uh, special meeting August 10th to make that decision. So no further questions by the authority will proceed unless you have something else to add. Thank you. Everybody set then? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, the acting chair of the finance committee, uh, Bill Millington, you have a report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do. Uh, met yesterday, and uh, we we heard a Treasury update from uh, Treasury officials by Microsoft Teams. Woody and Lon reported, uh, gave us an investment update, which was positive, and uh, an economic report, also uh, quite positive. Um, traffic and revenues, Mike Booby came forward and, and uh, gave information presentation on traffic and revenues, and, and uh, in particular, the month of June looked pretty good that he presented yesterday. We were pleased to see the uptick now that we're on the, the recovery from the pandemic. Um, there was an item regarding repayment advances, uh, and uh, Kim presented a uh, 200000 payment proposal, which was agreed on, and, uh, and then the fiscal year 2022 budget showed a projection of $24.4 million with uh, an operating expense net of $1.3 million. We've got a, a healthy uh, in for the year. And she also talked about the sale of grading pieces, which is going quite well. There's some demand for it. We're uh, receiving requests for it online and through social media. We're prepared to package them and get them in the hands of buyers. And uh, the promotional efforts for that will continue, right, Cami? Um, and uh, and that concludes our report. Are there any? Questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Very thorough, detailed report. Are there any questions of the finance chair? Then a motion would be in order to accept as presented. been moved and supported to accept the uh, report from the uh, finance chair. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. We'll now move on to the infrastructure replacement. 
Replacement Committee, uh, the Chair, Curtis Saito. Thank you, Curtis. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so since our last meeting, uh, board meeting, we've had uh, two additional meetings of the Infrastructure and Deck Replacement Committee. And since we had the presentation yesterday, uh, the engineers in the crowd absolutely were just uh, engaged totally all the way through it. The rest were hanging on. <laughs> I'm, <still here>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm going to turn it over to Julie uh, and to Tom to give a, a, brief, uh, a, or a, a brief presentation today on the findings of that report. Uh, and I won't do any specifics, but uh, Julie be the bearer of good news. Um, this is our third deck study that we have done over the years, um, and we're just completing our third deck study. We began in ju uh, July of 2020, and it's the most comprehensive deck study we've done so far. Each time we do a deck study, it, uh, it builds off the previous deck studies. We learn from the uh, previous studies and uh, build off that, and it's a good way to gauge the condition of the bridge over time. The results of the deck study are very favorable. We're happy to report that with strategically planned preservation, we are going to be able to push off the deck replacement for quite a few years. And so um, I would like to introduce Tom. And, uh, Tom is um, a National Bridge Practice Lead and Parsons Fellow. He has participated in more than 30 uh, annual inspections at the Mackinac Bridge. He led each of our main cable inspections at the bridge. He was uh, the lead engineer for our tower finger joint replacement projects in 1997 and 98. And he was the lead uh, engineer for the replacement of our bridge access travelers. And uh, he's, of course, the lead for this bridge deck study. He was involved not only in the field inspection, but all aspects of the study. So I will turn it over to Tom to give you a brief overview of the deck study. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Julie. And Mr. Chairman and members of the board, it's an absolute honor to be here and to have undertaken this deck study for the Mackinac Bridge Authority. So with that kind introduction, I might point out, as she said, Julie, that I have been involved with the Mackinac Bridge Authority for many years. On the left is a photo of myself. It was actually the Engineering of News Record uh, photo contest winner from 1984. Okay? So I got that out of my archive. <laughs> I, I thought it would be fun to put that up there. And then the uh, cable inspection project was undertaken, in one, of one of many, in uh, 2014. So just a little bit of humor there to kick off my presentation. So first, if I could, is uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the team. This was an enormous undertaking. You heard that it was the most comprehensive deck study ever. And not only was it enormous in scope, but it was undertaken in the middle of a pandemic, successfully, I might add. And that was done with this team, starting with the Mackinac Bridge Authority. The amount of support that we got from Julie's team and the Mackinac Bridge Authority just to access the equipment or access the bridge. The equipment was brought in from around the state, including equipment that the Bridge Authority themselves owned, and we were able to undertake the field inspection, as well as data provided by the Bridge Authority, including past wind records of many years of data recorded at the site, past inspection reports. We heard about the uh, studies as well, the 2010 and the 1999 deck studies and many other valuable information that was used as part of our deck study. Parsons, has, we served as the lead engineer on this project. Uh, Parsons <coughs> goes back many years, not just myself, but actually to Steinman. Steinman is the original designer. I began my career with Steinman. Steinman was acquired by Parsons, and then Steinman became Parsons Bridge Division, for which I'm their national bridge practice lead. So we have many years of experience at the bridge, 64, um, if, you, if you're counting. On the lower left is uh, a, a firm that specializes in service life modeling 
and probabilistic analysis of concrete structures, and in particular, deck structures. They're located in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We've worked many years with Turney Consulting Group, or sometimes TCG. We worked with them most recently on the new billion, dollars go billion dollar Gothels Bridge in New York City, and we're working with them now on the new Gordy Howe Bridge in Detroit. On the lower right is RWDI. RWDI is a world leader in aerodynamic studies of winds, uh, wind performance, and wind tunnel testing. They own a number of wind tunnels around the world, including one of the largest in, the, in North America in Guelph, Ontario, which was used for this study. We've worked with RWDI as well on many projects, the new Tacoma Narrows Bridge, for example, the new Gothels Bridge, as well as the Gordy Howe International Bridge. So with that, I'll move into some more particulars about our study. I think we need to look where we've been if we need to know where we want to go, as with any study of this type. So looking a little bit at the history of the bridge and past performance, it's opened in 1957. We, we all know that. It's Michigan's jeweler, their transportation system. It's a very complex four and a half mile crossing. The superstructure, the elements you see in the photographs are complex but the decks themselves are complex. They're all different types of decks throughout the four and a half mile crossing. And it retains its original deck, largely retains it, but for a few of the, uh, uh, some number of steel grid grading deck panels that have been replaced over the years, but largely it retains its original deck, which is not unheard of for a, a bridge of this age and magnitude, but it is unique in that regard. There are not very many that have successfully achieved this in this number of years. So how has that happened? The Bridge, Asso Bridge Authority, their maintenance and preser preservation program, there have been a number of overlays over the years. That's the replacement of the asphalt, milling and replacement, the most recent being in 2008 and 2009. Some of you may remember the uh, expansion joint and header reconstruction on the south viaducts. That was a very successful project and it's reaping the benefits today. And I mentioned the steel grading. There's been a number of steel grading panels that have been replaced on the bridge over the years, all beneficial in achieving where you are today. So the study, if we looked at it in the broadest sense, is a three-phased approach. The first is the investigation of existing conditions. That's the field investigation, field sampling and testing, and the laboratory analysis that came out of that. The second is to evaluate the remaining service life based on what we found from the field in investigation and evaluate the current load carrying capacity of the bridge and in particular the floor system that supports the deck itself. And then development of a rehabilitation or sometimes I prefer a preservation program and eventually someday a deck replacement um, evaluating the alternatives of what may be achieved when the time comes. So I'll start with investigation of existing condition. Um, first, we need to study what, what are the previous studies, what, the, what were those findings? And then we did the end-to-end, -end, above and below, inspection of the deck and floor framing. And when I say the floor framing, it's basically everything that comes in contact with the deck that supports the deck and the, and the vehicular loads and transmits that load down to the main superstructure elements. We did the in situ field uh, testing. The photo on the lower right is a photograph of a half cell electro potential measurement. And that tells us the potential for the deck to corrode, the bar reinforcement within the deck. It does not say it is corroding, but it tells us potential. And it, I emphasize that because if the overlay is able to keep the water out from, from uh, penetrating into the concrete of the deck, even if it did have potential, it wouldn't corrode because it doesn't have the electrolyte to uh, foster that reaction that would cause the corrosion cells to occur. And we also extracted 79 cores, Turney Consulting Group did that for us, 79 four inch cores were taken from the deck at various locations across the entire span and brought down to their labs in Kalamazoo, Michigan and tested for a number of different um, analysis techniques to tell us what the service life modeling will, will reveal. And as Julie said, we expect that in another 10 years, 2030, that another deck study will be undertaken. And that will validate over time all these studies that have been done 
and eventually leading up to a deck replacement sometime beyond 2030. So now, for, this, for the ter determining the service life, we looked at the compressive strength of the concrete. I mentioned we took the cores. Basically, how strong is that concrete compared to what it originally was intended to be? And it's very strong. The compressive strengths are up around some exceeding 7,000 pounds per square inch compressive strength versus the original design intent of 3,000. So several, or many actually, are almost double what was the original intent even after all these years. We looked at the chloride perme permeability testing and the chloride profiles, the chlorides that some over time penetrate into the deck and eventually will cause corrosion of the bar reinforcement. That chloride potential or the chloride measurements was very favorable for the corrosion conditions that exist out there today. We looked at the carbonation. That's a measure of the passivity of the concrete in order to protect against the corrosion. That too was very favorable. And we use that information, I should say Turney Consulting Group, our specialty subconsultant, for service life modeling. They create a service life model based on that input and the measurements in the field and predict when the initiation of corrosion may occur and the rate of that corrosion. And that, that is really the, the basis of the decisions they made going forward is the preservation and someday an eventual deck replacement. And the objective of all of these studies is actually to optimize the deck with the floor framing system so that one will not outlast the other. It's basically saying when it's time to do a rehab, do it all at once, and all of those elements will have reached the end of their service life at an optimal time together. So the outcome, we've learned, not surprisingly, that the MBA has been effective in maintaining the existing deck, largely because of the overlays and also not salting the roadway. The deck has not reached the end of its service life. There is a good bit of life left in the deck, and a well-executed e preservation program can maximize the service life. That is one of the objectives, right? And the bridge has the adequate low carrying capacity today, and if it's well-preserved, it will also in the future. So the preservation program, what would that perhaps look like? Deck resurfacing, no surprise there, except today we have impervious decks. On the upper slide we see, um, that's a, the most recent, the 2009 overlay, uses uh, a super pave. It's a very highly compacted concrete that's essentially impervious to water as long as it's in good condition, as it has been. Preservation program will continue on an as-needed basis, the steel grid deck replacement panels, the grading on the main span inner lanes, and repair of the concrete joints and headers. You remember I said that they did the joints and headers some number of years ago on the south viaducts. Now it's time to do it on the north viaduct. So there was a beneficial program that was done then, and the deck will benefit from doing that again on the north viaduct. So we need to now figure out how we're going to evaluate what a new deck might look like and what are the opportunities for improvement. So we, we were looking, we have looked, and I'll show you shortly, an evaluation of the lane widths, the railings, and the medians on the bridge. All of these currently original 1957 vintage, a 75 year service life, which is probably quite easy to achieve with the new technologies for a new deck, so there's not a lot of risk there. Any modifications to a suspension bridge needs validation of wind performance, in particularly when you're adding railings or if there's contemplating changing the configuration of the open steel grading. The Mackinac Bridge, I'll show you, has exceptional wind performance. And the ability to evaluate the constructability and when I say that, I mean constructing it while maintaining traffic. And so the, the alternatives essentially looked at maintaining all four lanes of traffic during the construction period, but for at night. Or said another way, essentially all the construction on the bridge would be occurred during nighttime hours, at which time the 
uh, bridge would be brought down to two lanes of continuous traffic flow and returned in the morning to full lanes of traffic flow. And we looked at criteria of how we would measure these uh, alternatives. And the criteria, each of which has its own measures of effectiveness, is safety, final condition user benefit, life cycle consideration, cost, structural performance, and construction considerations, namely the traffic control that I mentioned a moment ago. And this is the outcome of the study. If we boil it all down and we looked at the cross sections of many alternatives that we looked at, this is what we'd be facing. And if I could, on the upper cross section of the roadway, this is the existing cross section. We see in purple the outer lanes. Those are the concrete filled steel grading. They're overlaid. The traffic vehiculars ride on the pavement. The green inner ones are the current open steel grading. A curb rail, the original bridge rail, and underneath it the cross beams that support the deck. Those cross beams are 12 inch deep I beams. They're spaced about every five feet. 1,600 of them all the way across the span. For the suspension span, I mentioned all of the deck types are different across the bridge. For the suspension span, the proposed uh, preferred solution would be replace the cross beams, as some of them are deteriorated, but more so because they're welded to the current steel deck. It's very difficult to remove the existing grating, particularly the concrete filled steel grating, when it's welded to the cross beams. Reconfigure the open grating. So in this alternative, the open grating would be located near the bridge rail, along the lane line, underneath a medium barrier, and the same thing on the opposite side of the bridge. This grating is used because it's light in weight for the bridge and is very favorable for wind performance because it doesn't allow differential pressures to build up during wind periods above and below the deck. And that is one of the reasons that the bridge is exceptionally stable during wind performance. The alternative would also have crash tested barriers on the outer edges, a medium barrier between opposing traffic. The maintenance walk is moved outside and behind the barrier now. So you might wonder how would we, how were we able to get an 11 foot lane substandard, increase it to 12 foot lane and add a buffer along the shoulder. And that's achieved by widening the lanes, pushing every uh, the superstructure framing system towards the outer perimeters, and in a safe manner, putting the maintenance walk now behind the bridge rail, whereas before it was only behind the bridge curb. On the approach spans, I'll combine the discussion for the approach trusses and the viaduct spans because the decks are similar. They would be replaced with a reinforced concrete deck of lightweight concrete, similar to the concrete currently used on the main span. The roadway would be widened for two standard 12 foot lanes, new crash tested barriers, new crash tested median. The difference here from the original construction is the concrete would not be cast in place. There would be no concrete trucks coming to deliver wet concrete to the site. Rather, the deck panels would be precast off site and they would be brought in at night, as I described before, placed on the deck so the traffic could ride on it first thing in the morning. And that would again be for both the approach spans, the viaduct spans at each end, and the main truss spans. So I mentioned that the wind performance was exceptional. RWDI, they took the uh, wind data over many years that was acquired from all the regional airports. And I mentioned the Bridge Authority has a substantial amount of wind data at the Straits of Mackinac. And they arrived based on a climatology study of a design wind speed for stability of 103 miles an hour. That equates to something that statistically could occur once in every 10,000 years. So it's something that's very safe as far as setting the standard of the criteria. RWDI created a section model. It's a one in 40 scale model. It's about as big as the tables in this room. And they put it in their wind tunnel. We tested it for every possible configuration 
with and without the railings, with and without the modified grading that we talked about before. And we found that in all cases, the actual wind speed exceeded 200 miles an hour for stability performance, which is exceptional in itself, but I said exceeded that, and we don't know by how much because we stopped the testing so it wouldn't destroy the model or the instrumentation on the model. We also looked at the buffeting analysis. They gave us the wind buffeting loads, which means the pressures that uh, result on the bridge and the inertial effects of the wind and the interaction with the bridge. And we found that without exception, every member on the bridge has ad adequate capacity for the wind buffeting loads without strengthening during a deck replacement in the future. So very favorable. And now if we look at the timeline of all what I've just discussed and the cost of what it would take, first the preservation period. It's imperative that the preservation period take place prior to what I'll call a deck replacement program. It's not really a project anymore as we look at it. It's a number, it's a series of contracts that will occur sometime in the future. And we've looked at this from the preservation program occurring from basically current day or even the past preservations that have already taken place up until 2033 at a cost of 19 to 27 million dollars. And you remember the scope I talked about a minute ago, the overlays, the steel grading, the joints and headers, that's all would be included in this preservation program. Then around 2023 would be the start of the program. The first contract would be the suspension, suspension span deck replacement at a cost of 96 to $102 million. That would be followed by the North Viaduct deck replacement for 10 to $13 million. The largest of the three, excuse me, the largest of the four contracts would be both the North and South truss spans, which would entail an expense of 116 to $161 million. And then finally, the South Viaduct, remember that's the one that's already had gone through the Deccan joint and header reconstruction, would be eight to $11 million and completed around 2050, which would be just shy of the forecast service life of the existing elements of 2053. And once again, just a, a few years shy of the 100th year anniversary of the Mackinac Bridge. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions if I may. Thank you, Tom. Uh, very detailed. And I may add, once again, it's very, very interesting when you, you look at the structural integrity of that bridge after 64 years. So thank you for such a detailed report. Any members of the uh, authority have any comments, questions? Tom, great report. Thank you so much. Um, I, my question is the north and south approach, uh, trust spans, the, the cost variance is so high. You, from 116 to 161 million, is there a reason why uh, that that such a huge difference in cost? It, it is, you? actually, and, and it comes down to, at least in part, the construction means and methods. And I, I did not get into it, the brevity of today's presentation, but it's more difficult to replace the deck on the uh, truss spans if it were done from the bridge itself. Because unlike, if I could, I'll show you the 3D models here. Unlike the main span, where an anchor can be placed to three separate elements, the bridge steps on the log.
other one would be exploding the plate. We found actually it would be less costly to have exploding in the same way as some of the derricks we used to build the bridges the first time, where they could up, take the deck panel off, put the new deck panel, and have it open to traffic in any The spread there is because it considers both. And you might ask, well, why wouldn't we just list the weak one? Many contractors do not have exploding equipment. There's marine contractors, and there's bridge contractors, and there's some contractors that have both equipment. So we don't know at this point whether the contractors who would be interested in the job this many years out would have access and who would be bidding the job. So we decided to just go ahead and leave that one listed as it was. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay. Do you need any short relief? It, it would be good. Um, that would, in all likelihood, come out of the 2030 deck study, right? It's premature at this point to be saying who the shortlist would be. You're very welcome. Mr. Chairman, I think we, uh, it's the end of the committee's report, and I'd make a motion to accept the deck study report. Made is there support? Motion is made and supported to accept the inspection. Discussion. Motion. Hearing all the motion signify aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you, Tom. Huge team effort, thank you. Okay, we uh, will get right into old business, I believe. Uh, the South Tower Painting Project. Uh, Kim, bring us up to speed on that project. All right. Um, you'll see in your pack, uh, number, <laughs> number six is the South Tower Painting Project. Um, we've heard about this uh, and then a few years before that with the North Tower Painting uh, Seaway is about, uh, I'd say, about 85% complete right now with this project. And they're working on the west leg of the south tower right now, and it looks similar to what you see up there. They're working down uh, closer to the roadway. These uh, legs will be finished this summer, and that will be the end of this south tower project. Um, they had an extension of the completion date to July 28th, but they'll probably need another month of work to uh, finish up. So I expect another extension of time request to come in for that. So um, in the last report on the actual construction it will be, and then we'll be talking about the two-year warranty and doing the um, those things. This is kind of the last piece for our painting project, so we're ready to get it done with some consideration. <laughs> it's done. It's been working. With you back in two Very excellent. And it's nice to get the actually painted. It looks wonderful now at this point, even. Mm -hmm. I've seen a hand down here. Mr. Chairman, yes. When did the painting project begin, please? Well, um, we started it before I came there um, in the late, the mid 90s. Uh, we started with the bigger projects. And so we've been doing these painting projects in chunks as we went along. And we started the first project in the suspended span after I came there in 2002. And then we've been continuing with the truss spans. And we left for last because we weren't quite sure how contract was. So, um, so this is the culmination of all of that. All of that, yeah. So Thank you. Yeah, lots and lots of years. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Any other questions, concerns? Thank you very much. Next, we'll uh, have a report on maintenance project from our assistant engineer, uh, Cole. Cole, it's good to see you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, the chairman introduced me, I'm Cole Cavalieri. I'm the assistant bridge engineer with the bridge. And uh, we just had a presentation on the deck study and uh, you know, really good news as far as the condition of the bridge 
uh, at the age that it is. And a big part of that is the maintenance that we're, we do on the bridge. Uh, so this is uh, a little presentation on, on what we're currently doing. This is a snapshot of some of our daily activities. Uh, of course, we do more, but uh, this kind of gives you a taste of, of what our guys are doing daily. And um, I, I came from a, the consulting world before, and I used to do bridge inspections. And uh, it is really impressive what our Mac and Bridge staff can do and uh, their skills and how much maintenance they do in-house. Um, and they're all very proud of working on the Mackinac Bridge. Um, it's a wonderful place to work. Um, I, I took this picture last year during uh, one of our inspections. Uh, you can see the, one of our Peregrine Falcons up on uh, the cross there uh, <laughs> as we are underneath. Um, but it's, it's, it's to work, so. So uh, it's pretty well known the Mackinac Bridge is always being painted. Uh, there's the contracted painted painting work that Kim just talked about, but our guys are, are constantly painting the bridge as well. And basically, uh, in the structural engineering world, water is kind of the enemy. And uh, so we, we're constantly cleaning the bridge and repainting it, basically to give the steel a coating and a protective layer against that water from getting in and starting to corrode it. So it, it's always going on, and of course, it's a unique structure, so access is, is difficult sometimes, but our, our guys are, are constantly out there uh, cleaning the bridge and, and repainting it. Uh, although the deck is in, in great shape overall for its age, um, it is an older, it, 64 years old, so we do have deck patches that we do. Often it's, it's by joints, as you can see here. Um, it's one of our guys clearing out the bad concrete. And then up above, you can see a patch that's in place. Uh, lately, they've been using a, a different patching material that's actually a polymer concrete. And the benefit of this is it, it dries within hours rather than uh, days. So we can get the bad concrete out, put that polymer concrete in, and open up to traffic within hours compared to having to leave it set for a few days. Next slide. Um, a big push has been replacing our grading panels. Um, as we talked about in the deck study, those are uh, one thing that are, are reaching the end of its service life, and those panels are starting to uh, corrode at a, a faster rate than they used to. So uh, we, the last couple of years especially, we've been pushing, replacing those panels, um, and. Our guys have proven up to the task. Last year in 2020, even with the pandemic, they actually set a record of panels replaced. And this year, they're actually on pace to break that record this year. And this is all in-house staff. Uh, we, we purchase the, the panels and they take them out and, and put them back in. And part of the reason they've been able to do that record pace is our painters have actually been kind of drafted and uh, helped prep do the prep work for taking out the panels and also preparing the new ones for welding. So uh, it's really been a, a big team effort to replace those panels. Cole, are these the welded panels that Tom said, are the panels that are welded to the uh, stringers below? That, that they are, are difficult yeah. to manage because they're welded? They are, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite the process. Uh, they actually have to cut the old panels in sections to be able to get to those welded locations on the cross beams. And um, not in this photo, but uh, in some photos you'll see it, there's holes as they're taking it out and that's because they cut in them off those cross beams. And um, it's, it, it's, it's quite the process, but our guys have really gotten, a, gotten it down to a procedure that they're, they can, they've done a whole panel in a day actually. So it's, it's, they've really gotten it down. Um, another thing is uh, we have a beam crew, and uh, these are the guys who are underneath uh, doing steel repairs. Um, as you can see, this, this top photo is a cross beam repair. Um, like Tom said, uh, those, there's a lot of cross beams, and they've had some uh, fatigue cracking. It's something that's very well documented. It's been around since the 60s. Uh, nothing, nothing new, uh, but something that we're constantly taking care of 
and strengthening those cross beams in areas uh, that we need to. Um, and the bottom picture is actually, uh, they, they we put in some new steel last year uh, to strengthen the deck in an area that was um, showing some deterioration. And then uh, lastly, something Julie and I have been working on uh, is a, it's, a, it's a fairly minor project, but it's a, it's a visible project. So I just wanted to touch on it quick. Uh, this is uh, one of our traffic attenuators at the toll booths. And uh, these attenuators, they, they're actually still functioning. They're still up to spec. But this particular type is no longer manufactured. So the traffic attenuators, they're built to be hit. And um, when, we, when they get hit, we have to fix them. And since it's no longer being manufactured, it's getting harder to find replacement parts. Uh, so we're, we're planning this fall. Uh, we've been putting together the specs and everything to replace these attenuators with a little bit more modern attenuators with steel paneling. Um, so it'll be a slightly different look, but um, it'll be there to uh, protect our toll booths and, and protect traffic as they come in to the toll booths. So that's all I have if there's any other questions. Thank you, Cole. Very good report. Excellent. It's it's amazing how uh, report after report we hear and how fantastic our maintenance staff is. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the good work. And you've been a great welcome asset to the bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments, questions from the board members? Thank you, Cole. Thank you. Annual Bridge Walk is the next informational item. Uh, we have Julie and James, I believe. So the annual Bridge Walk preparations are underway. Uh, we've been busy ordering supplies and renting equipment for the event. We are having some law enforcement meetings um, uh, for the Michigan State Police presence on the bridge during the walk. We're also having some internal meetings to kind of refresh our memories. It's been two years since we since we did this, and so uh, refresh our memories with the minor, excuse me, the the more fine details of the event. Um, so we're having those internal meetings. Um, the scheme for the bridge walk will be the same as in 2018 and 2019, where a walker can start from either end of the bridge. They can walk any portion of the bridge, turn around, and go back to the side they started from, or a person could walk all the way across the bridge from one side to the other, starting from either end, but they would have to provide their own transportation to get back to their starting point. Um, we're planning on closing the bridge to all traffic from 6.30 in the morning to noon, as we have uh, in 2018 and 2019 as well. And to communicate all of this to the public, James is, has put together a comprehensive communication plan we will now talk about. Thank you. Good morning, James. Good morning. Thank you. Um, yep. Uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, we, we took a year off, so uh, <laughs> we, we do have to refresh our memories, uh, but the communications plan uh, we've largely uh, dusted off because we, we had uh, successful years of the walk in 2018, 2019 that we could look and uh, I think basing uh, our communication on that success is what's been guiding us. There are two, two core messages that we're working on getting out to the again, that the bridge is going to be closed during those hours of the walk. And then because our, our new configuration of participation starting from both ends, uh, we, we want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. For any participated in the bridge walk before where they had to start in St. Ignace, walk across, but, but hadn't participated for the 2018 and 2019 walks. We want to make sure that they know that information. Now, now again, uh, I, I think the success, not having the traffic backups on the north and south ends uh, during, during the uh, 2017 through 19 walks is an indication that we were reaching the right people. Uh, and then the success with the start from both ends in 2018 and 2019 indicates we were right, reaching the right crowds for that as well. So some of the highlights for the communication plan, uh, we are continuing uh, news releases, uh, reminding people of the conditions 
um, and then that leads to next point, uh, the bridge walk options video that we created uh, back in 2018 to, to visually explain to people how they can participate in the, in the walk. Uh, we've updated that each, each year of the walk. We've done that again this year. Um, social media, I, I don't wanna step on uh, Kip's presentation. Uh, we, we are uh, doing countdown tweets on, on the Mackinac Bridge uh, Twitter page. Uh, we, we will continue that right up until the, the day of event, sprinkle in some uh, additional tweets as, as needed. Uh, the posters that we've created, this will, this will be the fourth time we've done this poster. Information and uh, we've got good cooperation from uh, other state departments. Secretary of State has taken uh, the digital of this poster. They are creating a video that they're displaying on monitors in all the branch offices. Uh, DNR has worked closely with us post to all of their key facilities where they've had visitors uh, putting out the, the posters in state parks and uh, state forest campgrounds ahead of the event. Um, and then uh, they're also incorporating this information in uh, newsletters, emails that they send to park visitors. We're also putting these up in all of our uh, MDOT rest areas and welcome centers throughout the state, as well as our uh, MDOT facilities. Uh, the dynamic message signs on, on, our, on our freeways, we are continuing the messaging that we, we've done uh, for the past three walks, uh, letting people know primarily that the bridge is gonna be closed uh, during, during that uh, nearly six hour period on Labor Day. Um, we have been, uh, in close communication with uh, the MBA staff regarding traffic backups, particularly on the weekends and, and, uh, and some delays that people are encountering. So we've worked with the Statewide Transportation Operations Center uh, that, that handles these dynamic message sign messages uh, to incorporate also messages alerting people that they may encounter delays at the bridge at those peak periods, Fridays uh, in the afternoon primarily and, and Sunday late morning through afternoon. So those, th uh, there are many, many other things that we're doing as part of this communication plan, trying to reach people in many different ways, uh, but uh, th th those are the high points. Go ahead, Bill. The bridge walk. Does traffic, or do we anticipate traffic backing up onto the interstate system? What's the extent of the congestion that results from it? Sure. Well, uh, previous to uh, 2017, the first year that we closed the bridge to traffic during the event, uh, we would routinely get uh, multi-mile backups uh, of, of people waiting to cross. Uh, we, we had some traffic that, that was allowed, but it was, it was reduced significantly. Um, and, and so we knew that there was the potential when we closed the, the bridge completely to traffic, that you could have those same backups or even worse. And so before the 2017 walk, we really put our focus in making sure everyone knew that the bridge would not be open and that they should change their schedule accordingly. And uh, they, they did so. We had very little backup uh, that year or subsequent years. Thanks. Any other qu comments, questions? from the board members. Uh, James, you folks have done a remarkable job in the uh, communica uh, communication of the bridge closing and those, those backups have really disappeared yes. compared to what it originally was. And, and originally it wasn't as bad as what we thought it was gonna be, to be honest with you. Right. So uh, the communication efforts on your part have been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, I'm sorry. Kim, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yeah. Oh, I better have a computer. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to point out that Post Commander John Schneider is in the audience with us. Okay. And so he's been instrumental in organizing the massive amount of uh, Michigan State Police, and he's having his own meetings, he's having meetings with the Bridge Authority. Um, you know, we obviously could not do the event without without him and his troops. So I just wanted to point that out for you. 
Commander, would you like to come up and say a few words? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, we, we, we thank you for everything you do for the Mackinac Bridge Authority. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a workplace update now from our HR superstar. <laughs> Good morning, Kip. Good morning, board members. Uh, I wanted to know who did the agenda because I, I had to call up James after our, you know, he's such a key communicator, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know who I was going to be following up with with James. And so I'm here to give a brief update and review on the workplace setting for the NBA starting from the, this, the beginning of the pandemic until now, kind of what procedures were implemented, what's changed, what has remained as our staff has worked through this pandemic. And I was going to finish up the uh, presentation by mentioning our staff, but I'm going to do it to start. And I just want to mention the hard work and adaptability that our staff has gone through with this pandemic, specifically the maintenance crew and our tolling staff. Um, they have been there day in, day out, uh, keeping the bridge open, keeping the bridge safe for everyone. So really, I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, admin staff has been at home you know, most of the time working from home. Um, and the toll booth operators have been there every day taking money. Um, maintenance staff has been there cleaning accidents, uh, reporting, um, you know, and, and escorting trucks. So I just want to acknowledge them first. We'll go to the next slide. Um, if you remember back in September of 2020, I presented on a current setup for all three maintenance areas of the MBA, or all three main areas of the MBA. Maintenance was on a unique schedule of three 12s uh, with split crews. We dropped the driver assistance programs uh, and we adapted the maintenance crews to implement one truck rules for COVID protocol. Bridge services at one point had stopped collecting all cash at the booths and went solely to credit card transactions and masks were required at all times in the booths. Um, admin went on a work from home schedule. Uh, hand sanitizer stations were set up th all throughout the buildings and social distancing measures were put into place for customers coming into the building um, for service. So that was then, and this is kind of where we're at now. We can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, admin staff uh, developed a hybrid schedule starting on July 12th, where we're gonna have a variety of schedules, but most staff are going to uh, office three day and two day from home schedule. Masks are still required for non-vaccinated employees. Um, and as of June 25th, vaccinated employees are no longer, or were no longer required to wear masks <coughs> or social distance. And we're hopeful that in-person meetings between staff can pick up again soon. Since my presentation back in September, health questionnaires have also been set up and issued before logging into a computer. Uh, in addition to temperature check stations, at all main doors with the updated mask requirements as well now. Uh, a vaccination question was added to the questionnaire uh, that was not originally there. Go to the next slide. And then, so pictured here is the questionnaire with the preceding questions as well as a temperature check station that is set up. Like I said, at all main doors, we have one in admin and maintenance. Um, we also have one for the front area for uh, any mail coming in, um, UPS deliveries. Um, the temperature check stations and COVID sign-in sheets are at the main doors to catch uh, any employee that do not, any employees that do not normally log into a computer where the questionnaire is found. So uh, the first question, and it's a little blurry, but it says, are you physically entering the workplace or interacting with coworkers? If you answer yes, it auto-populates to the questions on the left, and you have to answer every question before you get a green acknowledgement button at the bottom. And so uh, just recently, like I mentioned, uh, was added the vaccination question. Uh, if you answer no to the question of a vaccination, it will populate an additional three questions that you need to answer again before submitting and being allowed to log into the computer. Um, where we're at with maintenance now. Uh, maintenance has begun discussing the return of the driver assistance program. Obviously, there's some more obstacles there too, as board member Kinley brought up prior to this meeting or prior in this meeting. Um, there's a large backlog, uh, or we've also started doing tower tour uh, requests again as well. 
um, and analyzing how we're going to handle those. There's a large backlog of those requests, and we want to honor the 2019 charity winners with their tours. Uh, we have plans to hire extra staffing to account for the tours, and so not to take away from staffing uh, from other important maintenance projects. Um, and it gives us the ability to also properly maintain Bridgeview Park with its reopening uh, and that plan to get that back online. Um, we're dropping the 312s as well. Uh, and when I mentioned the 312s, there's a four hour shift there with the two crews. Um, they've really been hard on them and they're really excited about getting back to that eight hour shift. Yeah. Um, and they're not going to be split anymore. So that was big for, for them as well. Uh, we're hoping too with the um, in-person fall prevention training and seasonal prep meetings and us being able to meet again that uh, that's coming back soon because that's very vital and important for them. Um, not only a safety aspect, but as a, um, you know, as a general crew, just being together and, and seeing how they're going to handle the seasons. Um, for bridge services, uh, masks are still required in the booths if you're not vaccinated. Um, and in-person training for toll, collector, toll collectors such as customer service uh, trainings are being reestablished. And we're also adding more staff uh, into the toll booths uh, and adding more scheduled staff on as we see that increase in traffic from the summer, as Mike reported, because the, the traffic has picked up, which is good. It's exciting. So again, I just want to mention, uh, I mentioned to start, I'll mention it again, our staff has been amazing with their adaptability. Uh, there's been constant changes. I can't, uh, I can't even think about how many times Kim and I have printed off the different guidelines that are coming in every day and having to get that communicated out and using Mike and, and, and Ned at the time for maintenance, Julie and Cole have been great at just, um, you know, getting all that information out and our crew has just constantly adapted well. So it's really a credit to them. That's it. Well, thank you, Kip. It's always yeah. a pleasure hearing your report. It's upbeat and optimistic and we're certainly yep. uh, turning the corner there. Thank you very much. No any members of the authority have any questions for Kip? Hearing none, thank you. Uh, Okay, social media update from our chair, Tricia. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, the chair asked me to give a quick update. We have a couple new members since we began the social media update that in this case, we're specifically talking about Twitter, not necessarily talking about Facebook, uh, Mackinac Bridge Authority Facebook page or Instagram, etc. So while it's labeled and we've called it social media committee and update, we're really talking most surgical aspect of of Twitter. Um, two things I want to give a shout to Kip because Kip because see extremely the uh, position has people with running the HR and and overseeing all of that and then on top of it pandemic. This is one kind of in the scheme when we created took the by the horns and with it, and I hope be by the end um, it into something very successful and beautiful. But uh, both Kip also he's bridge supervisors, uh, 10 through 8, who actually put the traffic on the weather. So we have tight controlled operation who acting this able to up. I do want to give a proper shout out um, to the and also to my, my committee member because we haven't had a subcommittee meeting I think you really agree the three it's not open now. I've really had to do much of anything. So that uh, we just want to update the number. So prior to April 19, specifically, uh, MBA did not have its own exclusive Twitter feed. 
am as an MP has many Twitter feeds, uh, has the Facebook page. They've got real updates to get traffic, primary traffic, suggestion occasions, and uh, updates. But we saw no real updates in that regard. Um, when I came on board, I thought, what a, what a neat way maybe um, hiding the beauty, the history, the fun parts, all the events um, that are going on at the bridge. So it was really sort of an experiment that the board agreed to. I think probably even myself included, this is an experiment. You really need to do this as a list. Um, really, most of the bridge is the top priority. We thought we'd give it a shot, and so far, we have to ask, um, get to, to help with the numbers. Anna, the bullhorn, immediately putting up a lot of pictures, history of the bridge, um, bridge events that were coming up, and that's really how we got our toes in the water. We immediately had quite a following. As you can see, by from April to the end of 2019, we were already at 2,500 followers, and that was far exceeding our expectations. Um, by May, May 8th specifically, we got Twitter's blue check, became official. What that means in the world, it, I guess it just means we can't have any other people posing as us People know the blue check is us. Um, so moving to this, you can see by the end of 2020, we are already at 4,500. By, by this time, 2021, this, this slide was created uh, a week and a half ago. We were at 7,100. And maybe, Kip, do you mind looking? I always check before we come in. Are we at 7,400 today? Okay, so in five days, we've added almost 300 followers. And so the growth is very, very rapid. Um, we'll just share, and I'm not a Twitter expert, so I've tried to take Kip's lead here. So we have the followers, so 70, nearly 7,400 followers. Then there is what's called an engagement rate. And Twitter actually calculates that, I believe, by the clicks, the retweets, the replies, the followers, dividing that by the number of impressions, people that are seeing this. And then you get an engagement rate. So it's an interactivity rate. And why we wanted to bring that up for you, and maybe we can go to the next slide, it's a little bit busy, and sorry, it's hard to see on here, but it's in your your packet but this represents what what i think is a compilation of m dot's 13 pages all throughout the region and we will just reassure you that no disrespect to any of the other m dot pages because they're wonderful but pretty much generally of engage of followers at least followers engagement is very high and that is due to drawing people in with the, the green of the flag. And I, I will share with you one example. And this came out uh, after we sent you the board packet. I'm sorry, I'm trying to look for my uh, pieces of paper in here. Well, and uh, Kip tweeted out a picture of the flag hanging. Sorry, massive amount of page. Uh, but I think we got 192 retweets and thousands and thousands of impressions and engagement in just one group. Probably hence additional 300, 400 hours about five years time. But just that picture alone, the flag flying down the bridge really captured people's, you know, hearts, minds, and attention. We get linked in the archivic reports. So drawing them in um, with the existing aspect, get the fires, and we're able to get them with, with weather, traffic delays, bridge closures. Um, hopefully, reading their, their drawings. 
but if it's passenger, they're going to get that and help to shortage. So um, hopefully, all in all, uh, you would agree. I think it's it's been a success. I, I do want to say I'm completely thrilled when I hear Kim and Melissa and Cami talk about their tweeting and retweeting our messages. So uh, when James is talking about their overall communications plan, really, I don't want to, to overstate Twitter. This is just one arrow in our quiver. And I think it's safe to say it's just become part of our regular communications plan. And isn't it is a, is a great thing, but we have so many great ways to communicate with the press releases and the billboards and the messaging signs, and this is just one more piece of that puzzle. So um, all in all, I think it's been a success. It seems to be on autopilot, and I think I'll add unless there's any questions. Thank you, Trish, and uh, let me say that uh, you and Kip have brought it a long ways. This what, three years now, maybe? Yeah, two and May, a half. Yeah, percent. maybe not quite three, but uh, anyway, I've been very impressed with how it's evolved to where it is today. And it's a great informational tool for the general public, just another way of communicating to them on what's going on at the bridge. So thank you. I, are there any other comments, questions? If not, thank you, Trish. Yeah, and thank, thank you. you, Kip, as well. Uh, okay, Kim, we have some information that you'd like to share with us about the uh, farm implements? Yeah. Um, if you remember at uh, one of our last meetings, we talked about House Bill 4165 that was proposed to allow farm implements on the Mackinac Bridge. And in your packet, I, um, I left some of that background information in there for you that you saw last time about how it was instigated by a, a manure hauler wanting to cross the bridge and um, with his farm implement and being told no. So that's how this all started. Um, so 4165, as you can see from the status up on the board there, uh, was transferred to the Committee on Transportation. Um, it, nothing happened to it after that until House Bill 4872 came out. And that, um, I included both of these bills in your packet also so you can see um, exactly what, what is being proposed. So 4872 actually adds into the bill um, the limited access freeway uh, ingress and egress points close to the Mackinac Bridge. So the previous bill just included the Mackinac Bridge. This one includes the parts of the freeway to get on and off the bridge and it has to do with speed limits, the 4872. So that has also been transferred to, referred to the Committee on Transportation. Um, and we're working with Troy Hagan from MDOT's, uh, he's the legislative liaison, uh, working closely with him, and the bill may come up to a hearing this fall, but we don't know if it will or not. So um, we may see more about it later <coughs> in the fall. Thank you, Kim, and uh, we appreciate you tracking the bill. I know we've all been watching it. <laughs> it's an interesting bill, and I'm certainly uh, will have a response if it does come to the committee hearing. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any comments, questions for Kim? Thanks. Bridge intruder status, uh, Councilor Kathleen Gleason. Excuse me for sitting. <laughs> this may not take all that long, simply because we do have some civil litigation going on. So there's not a lot I can say in public about it. But as you recall, there was an intruder who came onto the bridge, accessed the bridge from the southern portion in Mackinac City, climbed onto the bridge, was not detected <coughs> until later when his pictures came out on social media the prosecutor in Sheboygan County tr started prosecuting him. She tried to um, have a felony charge that involved four years in prison uh, attached to what he did. Unfortunately, as much as she tried, Kim was involved, many of us tried to make it work. The district court judge determined that it could not, it just, the statute was not, um, 
written to include the Mackinac Bridge, basically, because there's not a barrier around the entire bridge. I mean, we tried to make arguments. There's a water barrier. There is a height barrier for someone to access the bridge. Unfortunately, it, could, it did not work. So the case was dismissed, the criminal case. Um, once we saw what the problem was with that statue, we now in my office, working with Troy, working with Kim, and actually the Sheboygan County prosecutor has offered to assist too. Um, we have drafted legislation that would make the Mackinac Bridge a key facility uh, so that if someone did trespass in the future, it will be a four year felony instead of a misdemeanor. So we're very hopeful that within a couple months at the most, this will um, get the legislature's attention and hopefully be passed. So that's the criminal update on that case. Civilly, um, this defendant, and this is where I can't say too much, but he, um, we saw some things that he was doing on social media, um, putting information out there to the general public that was not appropriate, that we would not want to have him share. So we started a civil lawsuit against him. Um, he is a Cincinnati resident. Um, when we started the case, he was in jail because he has had uh, incidents in other states also. Uh, we were able to serve him easily, thank goodness. He was out of jail, but we still were able to serve him. He has um, retained an attorney since then, but the good thing is um, we filed, along with our complaint, we filed a request for a temporary restraining order. And his um, attorney and him, he agreed to what we wanted without a hearing. So until July 23rd, which there will be a hearing then, um, he has agreed, he's already taken down all his posts on social media, um, all the videos, he was trying to sell some merchandise that involved his illegally begotten images of the bridge. Um, he's removed all of that from social media. He's agreed not to walk, drive, or climb upon the bridge. And he's also agreed not to encourage other people uh, to access the bridge for trespassing. So what is nice is that we've gotten so far what we want. Uh, we will see there are indications that he's willing to settle the case. Hopefully that's the case, we shall see. Um, so more to be determined on that. So, but so far so good. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, uh, the under new business, first item is the St. Ignace 35th or 350th uh, birthday resolution. Uh, chair of that committee, Caroline, you have a report and an excellent resolution that you have drafted. Kim has asked me to uh, just read the resolution to you. I don't know if there's any other business that goes with this. Okay. Whereas the Straits of Mackinac region has been inhabited by indigenous peoples, principally the Chippewa, Ottawa, Huron, and Menominee for centuries due to the region being the source of abundant fisheries, wild game, and trees for sugaring, and whereas the Straits of Mackinac being the confluence of two great lakes was recognized as a strategic location for a command post for 17th century Anglo and European explorers and settlers, and whereas in 1671 Jesuit priest Father Jacques Marquette established a mission on the north shore of the Straits of Mackinac, which he named in honor of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, and whereas the city of St. Ignace, having been occupied and thriving for 350 years, is one of the oldest continuously occupied cities in the United States of America, and whereas the city of St. Ignace is the childhood home of several persons who, having attained positions of high office in their state and country, made significant and important contributions to their fellow Americans well beyond the confines of their hometown. Vice Admiral of the U.S. Navy, Aubrey Fitch, U.S. Senator Prentice M. Brown, Wisconsin Governor Anthony Earle, 
Congressman Robert Davis and Secret Service Agent Gary McLeod. And whereas many citizens of the city of St. Ignace have made and continue to make important contributions to and sacrifices for their country through their service as soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen in all of our nation's military conflicts. And whereas the citizens of the city of St. Ignace were instrumental in their support for the financing and construction of the Mackinac Bridge and continue to provide labor and maintenance services of the highest standards and whereas the city of St. Ignace is home to the executive offices of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, which oversees day-to-day -day operations, maintenance, and management of the bridge, including the supervision of special events, which mutually benefit the Mackinac Bridge and its surrounding communities through approximately $130,000 in increased toll revenue and economic impact on the streets area of over $41 million annually. Now therefore be it resolved that we, the undersigned members of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, congratulate the city of Sittingness upon the occasion of its 350th anniversary and look forward to many more years of the positive, mutually beneficial relationship we have enjoyed with the city. Thank you. Excellent. And it certainly is a resolution that should be noted for the record and fully adopted by the board. I, I believe it would be appropriate adopt his resolution and it was presented by yourself and I believe Kim at least to the uh, festival for the St. Ignace that day. So a motion will be in order. So I so move that Kim and I present this uh, upon the celebration of the city of St. Ignace's 50th anniversary. Second. It's been moved and supported to adopt the re resolution uh, recognizing the 350th birthday of St. Ignace to be presented by Caroline and Kim. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. We have Michigan um, Mobility 2045. Brad? Good morning. I greatly appreciate you allowing us to come here this morning to talk about our new state long range transportation plan that's going to be released for comment here in the next few weeks. So what I wanted to discuss with you today is really to highlight some of the highlights from this new draft plan, our approach that we've taken to develop this plan as well as to really talk about what is this plan overall and how it's organized. And so from here, the state long range plan really is a state of Michigan long range plan, which is a multimodal policy based document that establishes the vision, the goals, the objectives and key strategies for the future of transportation in the state of Michigan. As you can see on here, we've been working on this for quite some time. We took the vision to the State Transportation Commission two years ago, and now we're about ready. We just wrapped up our strategies. This is a federally required document and must have a 20-year planning horizon as a whole. Um, one of the things we want to highlight here throughout this effort is just the extensive outreach we've done with the public and stakeholders throughout this effort. As I mentioned, we really wanted this to be a state, long a state of Michigan plan, not an MDOT plan. And so when we look at what we've done over the last few years, we've done countless surveys and telephone town hall events where we've reached out to over 14,000 people across the state. And this map here shows across all counties of the state where we were able to reach. So that involved two surveys with MetroQuest, uh, an attitudes and perception survey, as well as a s service needs with dis for the disability survey. So we've worked with partnership with the Department of Civil Rights to also talk about what their needs are to ensure that where we go forward is for all users. And then we did a combination of in-person meetings prior to the pandemic and a lot of virtual workshops during the pandemic. And then from there we have our website, michiganmobility.org and our social media page. So this table of contents really structures what the long range plan will look like when you guys see it over the next few weeks. After we talk about what is the plan, we talk about looking to the future, 
talking about our trends and our revenues, shaping the future, discussing the vision, the goals, and the objectives, which you have in one of the handouts in your agenda packet, and then getting into discussion on partnerships, mobility and accessibility, and then the community, environmental, and health. And then from there, we get into our performance measures and where we are as a system performance-wise, and then a quite a heavy discussion on our needs. And so we talk about six chapters here which focus on needs multimodally as a whole. And then finally, we get to our strategies which have been adopted, and that explains our recommendations and how to achieve the vision of the plan as a whole. So one of the things we really want to highlight in this long-range plan is that we really took a step further in the idea of multimodal transportation. In the past, we've had all these different specific statewide modal plans that have put, and get put together in addition to the state long-range plan. This time, we decided to integrate all these all in the spirit of multimodalism to do it all as a whole. And so in addition to the state long-range plan, we are satisfying the requirements for the state freight plan in this effort, the requirements for a state rail plan, which are both federally required as well. But then in addition, we're doing our very first statewide active transportation plan and a statewide strategic plan for transit as a whole. And so all of that has been encapsulated in this effort here as a whole. So this next slide really tries to explain and what we realized through this effort was it doesn't matter what mode of transportation, it doesn't matter who owns the infrastructure, we all have the same, we all want to get to the same place in the year 2045. And that vision statement that you see in your packet really encapsulates what everyone has said where we want to be. The challenge is, and I'm going to have you s go to the next slide here, and we kind of use this graphic. If people were trying to travel across the state from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron, for example, then each, each mode of transportation is at a different point right now in time in terms of the maturity of its system. So on the highway side of things, we have a very mature system where we're focused on preservation, safety, operations, as well as looking to the future to make it more compatible with new technologies and resilience with, with the weather events. But when we look at some of the other modes like passenger transportation for transit or for passenger rail, we obviously have still have, so would like to do some more expansion of service to cover more users and to have better coverage overall. And then on the far extreme is the active transportation where right now we still don't have an inventory of where all of our assets on the active transportation system is statewide and we're working hard to figure out how to put that together. So before we can analyze even what the needs are for active transportation, we need to know where they're at in terms of where it's covered and then what condition it is that in. And so you'll see active transportation with the bike is probably just the least furthest along. But as a whole, everyone wants to get to the same point by the year. We all want to reach the other side of the state by the year 2045. And so MM 2045 provides a foundation for developing Michigan's transportation programs. That includes our five-year transportation program for MDOT, as well as the statewide metropolitan and rural transportation improvement programs. It presents the social and economic cases for transportation investment in Michigan and the fact that our social and economic prosperity depends on our investments as a whole. Also, our engagement and input throughout this effort, as well as moving forward in implementation, has really been incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion in who we've brought to the table, who we engage with, and who we reach out to as a result of this effort. Next slide. And so the next chapter really gets into our discussion on trends, forecasts, and scenarios. So obviously, right in the right dab in the middle of developing this plan, the pandemic hit us. And so the chief challenge is, how do we think 25 years out into the future when we don't even know what the next year is gonna look like? <laughs> and so that has been a chief challenge throughout this. So one of the exercises we did is something referred to as scenario planning. And so I'm not sure how many of you have heard of scenario planning in the past, but basically, since we can't just rely on past trend analysis to tell us what the future is gonna be, we, t we, we look at different, different scenarios or potential outcomes to say, based on growth in the economy, 
or growth in technology at various levels, what would be the policy implications that we would need to put in place? If we saw a high growth in technology and a high growth in the economy, and that's what the far right scenario shows us in terms of growth overall versus the opposite extreme where we have very little growth in either end and then a combinations of. And so we, we used our new statewide travel demand model which puts some plumbing in place to test for connected and autonomous vehicles and to look at how travel characteristics could change. And so this scenario exercise we have some policy recommendations if any of those four outcomes come to fruition what we should be doing in terms of moving forward. And so other things that we want to highlight through all these scenarios is we are still seeing aging population. Freight is critically important throughout this as well as we will be moving forward with electrification and autonomous vehicles as a whole. Next slide. The other big piece that we talk about here is the revenue side and that's where the other shoe drops in many cases because we all know where we are with revenues. But the reality that we really wanted to explain here is everyone wants to achieve this vision and, and we looked at it, everyone across the board has unmet needs right now. And the reality that we found out here when we did our revenue, long-term revenue forecast is we only have enough revenue to meet half of our needs across our multimodal system over the next 25 years. So the main message is we do, if we're going to be able to really meet that vision or come close to that, everyone across the board needs twice as much money in their programs. And not only with the program, but we also need staffing, resources, data, and tools in order to be able to make those decisions to de deliver a program that size. And so the big thing we wanted to say across the board with this plan is this is not about trying to say that a certain agency or a certain mode needs more money than someone else, but to say we're all in this together and we all need to work together as partners to come up with innovative solutions in order to do this as a whole. And then we, I, th but the positive side is we do identify several strategies on how to reduce that gap overall in the terms of the implementation of the plan as a whole. And so the next, uh, move to the next slide. Um, you will see in your handouts here the vision, the pr guiding principles, the goals and the objectives of the plan that were adopted. And then moving along, I won't, I won't go through all these chapters on here, but for your, you'll have this presentation which outlines more details on each chapter of the plan and what we're attempting to cover. I'm gonna have her advance to the last few slides here as a whole, which really talk about our schedule and our next steps moving forward. So overall, we're going to take this draft plan to the State Transportation Commission in just under two weeks here on July 22nd. It will go out for public comment for the remainder of July through the end of August. So we would encourage if you have time to take a look at that plan, let us know what you think and provide your comments back to us. We will then spend the bulk of the month of September uh, taking those comments and updating the document accordingly and then take it to the State Transportation Commission at their October meeting for adoption. And so with that, I would be happy to take any questions this morning. This may be outside the scope of your presentation, but um, high speed rail and profit that are advocating establishing rail between Harbor and city. Are you Yes, those are included as plan requirement is to look at an illustrative list of projects going out 20 years. So those are being discussed as part of the state rail plan component of this plan. So yes, those are in there. Questions, comments? Thank you, Brad. That's yep. a very detailed, interesting report. Yep, thank you. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is the fall meeting uh, 2021 uh, to be at Michigan. Is that correct, Kim? And we also have a uh, August 10th uh, meeting in Lansing, Michigan. Okay. Just as a sidebar, uh, 
being that travel is so far between here and Houghton, for those of you on the authority and staff and anybody that attends the board meeting, would like to stop by uh, our deer camp on the way back. <laughs> it's only a few miles out of the way, but uh, we'd love to host a luncheon for the MBA and staff, and uh, we have a, a pretty two unique suspension bridges in the area that you'll see, and uh, those will be included in the tour as well. So with that being said, uh, item we have a closed session to discuss the legal question about the MBA providing wind escort services. Uh, in order to go into closed session, session, we would have to have a motion by the board member, Kirk. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll move that the board meet in closed session under section 8H of the Open Meetings Act to discuss attorney-client privileged information that is exempt from disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Thank you. Is there support to that motion? It's been moved and supported. Uh, this requires a roll call vote. If there's no discussion, I don't believe there's a discussion on closed session anyway. Uh, at any, uh, Kim, would you call the roll, please? Yes. 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 Motion carried, and let the record reflect that uh, we went into closed session at 1057. And rather than everybody leave the room here, we're going to go up.
Yes. has been reconvened. It's, uh, what time is it? <laughs> 12.20, roughly speaking. 12.18. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, public input. Is there any public input? Yes, sir. Yes, if you would. Thank you. Good afternoon. I realize I'm the last thing between you and lunch. So yeah. Do this. Do this quickly. Should have. Should have done it earlier. Thank you. Uh, I, my name is Chris Burns. I am the new uh, economic development director for Mackinac County. So on behalf of our organization, welcome you to uh, to Mackinac County, and want to thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, jobs and staff that you provide uh, here in in Mackinac County. Um, in particular, that they're full-time year-round jobs, because we have quite a seasonality uh, issue here that we deal with in, in Mackinac County. So first of all, one, thank you for that and for, and for meeting here. I'm sure you're going to, though, uh, by having this meeting on Mackinac Island, you're going to get more of those questions about when does the bridge swing over here. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> we do actually deal with that with tourists. So, um, But I do want to point out, uh, transportation is ultimately very critical uh, to Mackinac County. We're a long uh, coastal uh, uh, county, 13 townships and two cities spread along the, the coast. We have mining ports. We have, of course, ferry boat uh, uh, ports. We have bridges, we have tunnels, with transportation is, is huge uh, uh, for us here. And the Mackinac Bridge and the Mackinac Bridge Authority has shown for a long time a very good example of how the public can do transportation well. And so first of all, I wanna thank you for all of that. We recognize that and I think it's important for us to be able to build off your experiences and, and what you're able to bring to the, uh, what you do bring to the, uh, to the county. It's a very successful model. Um, we are also, though, interested in developing other uh, modes of transportation and the ports in particular uh, that serve them, ferry boats being a great, great example of that. We have not just uh, ferry boats here to Mackinac Island from both St. Ignace and Mackinac City, but also Bablo uh, Island from Sheboygan and, of course, Drummond and, and other islands around the, U the UP. Um, I do want to let you know that we are getting some, some tremendous uh, partnerships and support uh, we've been working with the tribe and the uh, Sioux Tribes Economic Development Office. We were able to apply for a federal grant through the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, that's allowing us to do some study of those ports and where the potential is there for business growth and job growth in particular. Again, year-round jobs uh, being, a, being a key goal for us. Um, but also then how to, how to sustain that and sustain that, uh, that business uh, here in Mackinac County. And uh, as part of that, we we're working with a spin-off company, the Starline company started uh, Mackinac Marine Services that does repairs to that class of ships, the 50 to 200 ton uh, ships that those ferry boats uh, fall within, um, and has a project uh, to, uh, uh, that we are helping to uh, try and advance. And so we just recently applied to the Michigan Mobility and Electrification uh, Program to be a test site uh, for two pieces of, of advancement in our ferry boats uh, to this, uh, in this area. Uh, one is the ability to uh, be able to transition uh, those, those fleet of ships, again, the 50 to 200 ton uh, ships, from diesel drive systems to electric uh, drive systems. And so we're, we're very interested in, in, in that, but also uh, part of that uh, uh, research that's being done, we're partnered with Michigan Tech uh, university and going to be doing some testing uh, in the straits for the potential to generate hydro power. Uh, there are significant currents as, as, as we know uh, here in the straits area and in particular there's the ancient riverbed running between St. Ignace and, and Mackinac Island that runs at depths uh, over 200 feet and they've not done any measurements at depth for those currents and so that's part of the testing that, that, that we'll be doing and of course then that's feeding all into the to our energy supply and creating the system then to be able to charge a 200 ton uh, ship uh, you know it's difficult right now just to charge your little Prius um, and so those are some some great challenges and the, st the state has been very supportive uh, of that effort 
Um, we are hoping then to be able to partner with you because you've been collecting a lot of wind data uh, that we hope to be able to make use of uh, as well. And so we hope to be able to be partnering with you. And I'm sure some of the information we'll be gathering on the currents and so forth will be useful to your engineers as, as well because that bridge has got to stand in that water uh, too. And so we want to uh, really look forward to working with you on, on all of that. Um, the um, uh, uh, I did want to let you know that the uh, Mackinac Island Transportation Authority has some public input sessions coming up. Um, and while they're focused specifically on ferry boat service serving uh, Mackinac Island, it's a good example of the state of Michigan uh, providing funding to look at the transportation uh, needs and the future potential in the Straits area uh, specifically. So we hope to build on that. Um, and in light of that, the really the main reason was uh, to get up here is to invite any of you that could make it to a uh, boat cruise, I'll call it a party <laughs> that we're having on October 9th, or excuse me, on July 19th, that's just 10 days from now, um, on a Monday evening from six to eight, we're going to be hosting a cruise uh, that, that goes by several of the port developments under the bridge and, and, and so forth uh, with local officials, public officials, uh, some of the companies that have expansion plans that we're trying to help, uh, such as Mackinac Marine Services and, and, and so forth. The Michigan Tech folks will be here and, and what have you. Uh, so from six to eight, we'll get an email invitation uh, out to you. Um, bring your guest. Uh, if the, we're gonna be inviting the staff uh, from here uh, as well to participate on that. So we really look uh, look forward to that. Um, and um, and we'll be happy to help promote that bridge swing schedule as soon as you guys get that worked out. Um, we're, 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 we're here to help. We really uh, do appreciate what you guys do for the Straits area. Aside from just providing a bridge, the jobs and the people are just terrific and really part of, part of what makes us a, a great community. So thanks for being here today. Thanks for being here for the last uh, 50 years. and the next 350 uh, okay. with us as well. Well, thank you for your compliments. Yeah, we appreciate your comments as well. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to address the Bridge Authority? Hearing none.